everybody. Um, I'm Ernie Lau, the manager and chief engineer for the Honolulu Board of Water Supply. And before we get started uh, this evening, uh, every day I, I look at the news and every day I, I get very sad uh, to see what's happening happening on Maui, uh, and especially in the, what happened to Lahaina. So if we could just take a few moments a moment of silence here in remembrance and uh, prayers for, for the Ohana that has suffered in Maui very badly. Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, so I'm Ernie from the Board of Water Supply. Uh, just want to welcome everybody here. Uh, that's come out to listen to us talk about uh, proposed water rate increases for the next five and a half years. Uh, it's very important for us to increase water rates. Uh, we want to do it very carefully because we need the revenue to actually continue to pay for the operation of our water system and also invest in our infrastructure that is necessary to deliver this precious resource to our community island wide. So, I'd like to introduce, first of all, uh, from the Board of Water Supply, we have a, a board member here, Mr. Jonathan Kaneshiro. Thank you, John. <laughs> it's very shy. Uh, we also have a Board of Water Supply team, so please, as I call your name, if you could stand up and uh, be recognized. Uh, so, uh, from our Water Resources Division, uh, Mr. Barry Usagao. Uh, from our Water System Operations Division, which is responsible to operate this water system across the island, Mr. Kevin Ewing. We have also uh, Kathleen Elliott Pine Nui, our Communications Office, Information Officer, and uh, a lot of our team is here tonight to support this meeting. Uh, Mr. Joe Cooper uh, from our Finance Division, our Waterworks Controller, and Joe, you want to introduce us, uh, June, also from finance. Okay, thank you. Then in the back row here, uh, starting with Raylan Nakabahashi, our executive support office under the office of the manager. She's responsible for procurement, security, and also uh, making sure that we prepare our budget each year, our operating and CIP budgets, uh, so the board can adopt it. Uh, head of our field operations division, Mr. Jason Nakaido. So this is an important person. If you have a main break uh, or you see water leaking out of the road, uh, it's his division that goes out and, and does the repair. And they work until it's completed. Uh, also, we have a board of water supply. We have land all over the island that we have to manage to. So our land division head is Mr. Mike Matsuo. And moving over to this side of the room, did I miss anybody here? I think I got everybody. Uh, we have, starting in the back row, uh, the uh, program administrator for our water quality division, Mr. Ron Fensemacher. Well, actually, I would say Dr. Ron Fensemacher. <laughs> Thank you. Head of our IT division, which is responsible for the enterprise IT systems that we depend on, Mr. Henderson and uh, And then also, on that same row at the very end is J.D. Murasaki, our head of our Capital Projects, Projects Division, which is responsible for design and construction of the water system infrastructure. Uh, moving on to the next row, we have uh, uh, Jennifer Elfline, head of our Customer Care Division. So uh, if you have a problem with a high bill or uh, you have a leak in your house, please see Jen after the meeting. Uh, she's we're very glad to help you out. Uh, and uh, I think we got everybody here. Did I miss anybody else from the university? Uh, if not, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dave Ebersole uh, from a company called CBM Smith. Uh, they're the company, the consultant that's working on the new water rate proposals here. And I'll uh, have Dave actually do the presentation and uh, we'll open up to questions after we're done. Um, Thank you, Dean. Thanks, Ernie. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here for this important conversation about 
the BWS has proposed changes to water rates and charges. Um, as we kick off, I wanted to point out probably the three most important words on this slide, Paviola, uh, just recognizing that you know, here on an island, all the water we have is the water that we have right here. And so uh, how we act as stewards of that, take care of that, and bear the responsibility of delivering it to you becomes incredibly important. Um, I will say, Ernie said, um, I'll go through the presentation, do questions at the end, but since it's a fairly small group, I will welcome questions uh, on any slide as we go through stuff. If you have a question, please please ask up. I would ask that you come to the microphone, though, so the whole room can hear. It's right there and should be live for everybody. So um, with that, I'll, I'll jump in. So the Board of Water Supply was established in 1929. It's a semi-autonomous agency of the city and county of Honolulu, meaning that it has its own board responsible for setting policy, establishing rates, and it's funded solely by the money brought in by delivering water to its customers. So solely funded by ratepayers. It doesn't receive any funding from taxes or, or other, uh, other sources like, like taxes. So, um, and the rates we're talking about tonight apply only to water rates. We're not talking about sewer or anything else. It's just the water rates. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, wastewater charges are determined by the Department of Environmental Services, a different part of the city, and those rates are approved by the city council. So the board delivers safe, dependable water uh, to your home every minute of every hour of every day. Um, and doing this requires a large and complex system. So within that system there, uh, when we talk about the sources of water, there's 13 tunnels, five shafts, 194 groundwater wells and pumps. Um, some of that water needs to be treated to remove legacy contamination from, say, agricultural operations. So there's 13 treatment facilities. There's 172 potable water reservoirs around the island that store water and help maintain pressure and constant service. Uh, there's 192 booster pumps, over 2,100 miles of pipeline, 21,000 fire hydrants serving 170,000 customer services or a population of nearly a million people. The board delivers on average 144 million gallons of water each and every day. Now, I mentioned that all the money comes from the fees that are charged to deliver water to its customers. So let's talk for a second about where that money goes. If we start uh, at the top of the pie um, and go clockwise around the circle, the first thing you'll see is the capital improvement program. These are projects like new and replacement pipelines, treatment facilities, new, new supply wells. Uh, that's what a uh, capital improvement project is. And some of that is paid for in cash each year, and some of it is paid for by borrowing money. That's, and the repayment of those loans is the purple slice, the debt service. So if we add the cash funded part and the repay the loans part together, that's about 27% of the board's budget each year. Moving then clockwise to the orange slice, 19% of the budget is for employee salaries. And if we add in health and retirement benefits to that, that equals about 29%. Uh, the gray slice is the annual operations and maintenance expenditures. These are for uh, equipment, uh, uh, all sorts of things necessary to maintain the system. Uh, and then the green slice, that's electricity. Uh, it, it takes a lot of power to pump water out of the ground and move it around the island and de deliver it to, to your homes and businesses under pressure. So uh, that's about $33 million or 12% of the budget. Then there's a little teeny sliver for other things. Uh, you see it's a really small amount. Uh, the, the, I mentioned the capital projects. So rate increases, the last round of rate increases were approved in 2018. And this slide is showing what the board has done with that money, how it's been invested in capital projects. So in total, if we look at projects that are in planning, design, and construction, there's been a total of nearly $770 million invested in nearly 500 new projects. Again, these are things like pump repairs, new pipelines, 
treatment systems, all those things take money to, to repair, replace, and, and maintain. In March of 2020, we all experienced a massive disruption in our lives with the global pandemic. And um, that, that event caused big changes for the board also. One of the biggest ones was a dramatic change in customers' water use patterns. As the island's tourism-driven tourism -driven economy came to a near immediate halt, um, residential usage increased, non-residential or business usage dropped, a number of other things got set in motion with that, one of them being a global supply chain shortage, which then um, led us into this high inflationary period that we're all familiar with and have been individually impacted by also. Now this shows from 2019 to 2023 uh, two things. The green line at the top is the total inflation. So if we add each year's inflation on top of the previous, uh, and that's gone up about 21%. Uh, the yellow line shows the increases in the Board of Water Supplies revenue based on rate increases that were approved back in 2018. And you can see a big gap in those two things. That gap is about 8%. Uh, if we think about that in terms of uh, an annual budget of about $270 million a year, we're talking roughly you know, a gap of $25 million a year. It's a big number. <clears throat> Another thing that has happened, uh, you've all noticed your electricity bills going up, and I mentioned that the board's uh, power costs are a big chunk of its annual budget. The top line in purple shows the, uh, the board's uh, power consumption. This chart is going from July of 2020 to, to present day, about June uh, of 23. And that dashed purple line shows a nice downward trend. The board has been working really hard to do everything it can to reduce its power consumption. But if you look at the green line in the middle, that's the energy cost factor that's charged by Hawaiian Electric. And that has nearly tripled during this period of time, going up from about 10 cents a kilowatt hour to 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Put those two things together and we come up with the orange line, with it, which is the monthly power cost. Uh, it was running about $2 million a month. It's now over $3 million a month. And if we look at fiscal year 23, um, total expenditures on electricity were about $33 million or 20% above what was anticipated. So these are big numbers when we add them up. Certainly you've all been following the Red Hill issue. It's hard to, uh, to not hear about it. Uh, and uh, responding to that is going to require large investments in new port of water supply facilities. Uh, those include things that are currently underway like monitoring wells and exploratory wells to find safe places to put in new sources. The board needs to, in total, replace about 17 and a half million gallons of potable uh, water pumping capacity. And so a number of things are still undetermined. The full impact to water quality, uh, the impact to operations and maintenance costs, and the ability to recover those costs from the Navy. All of those are as yet undetermined. In response to these things, the board has done a lot to tighten its belt. Some of those actions include choosing not to pass on its increases in energy costs to its customers, deferring the purchases of replacement vehicles and other equipment, and also deferring less critical capital projects, pushing them out into the future. The benefits to customers have been the ability to stick to the rate increases that were already approved back in 2018, and also keeping the current year's uh, operations and maintenance budget essentially flat. If you think about that in terms of ongoing inflation, that's a net you know, decrease, right? So uh, these are really important actions that the board's taken that have discrete benefits to customers. But nonetheless, water rates need to go up. And so this is a delicate balance. Uh, and the scale here is on purpose. It's that balance between how much to spend on operations and maintenance and new capital projects to maintain a safe and dependable water service versus maintaining rate affordability for, for its customers. What's being proposed is 
uh, rate increases that will help fund about $1.26 billion in 132 new capital projects uh, over the next six years or so. And there's a lot going on in, on this chart, so let me walk, walk you through it. The, let's start with the gold ribbon uh, towards the bottom. Those are sources. Um, so the, you can see at the beginning there, there's a big investment in monitoring and exploratory wells, which is part of the board's response to Red Hill. And then you can also see the Kaliloa Seawater Desalination Plant. The board has recently awarded a construction contract for its first seawater desalination facility. Uh, and then towards the tail end of the period, you see an investment in new sources. Those are those replacement sources that we talked about, again, in response to Red Hill. If you move up to the next line, that light blue ribbon, uh, that is facilities. Those are things like security, control systems, facility improvements, and there's a pretty even level of spending. Over the period, about $118 million of investment in those facilities. Going then up to the green ribbon, you can see the real action here is towards the end where there's the construction of some new uh, reservoirs in Wyava, a uh, total of just shy of $100 million. Then we get to the dark blue. These are the uh, pump renewal and replacements. These are the big pumps that help move water around the island, uh, get water up into storage, maintain fire pressure in the fire protection pressure in the system, all of those things. Finally, the top ribbon uh, is pipelines, new and replacement pipelines. And uh, this, these investments help keep down the number of water main breaks. What's being proposed here is a total investment of about $425 million to uh, uh, replace and install over 41 miles of pipeline. Now let's talk about customers for a second. Right, this is really about you, and uh, the board divides its customers into different classes or families, if you will. First is, and these are grouped based on similarities in water use patterns, similarities in water usage. So first is single family residential customers, then multi-unit residential, then agricultural, non-residential, and non-potable and recycled water. So if we go to the top and think about single family residential customers for a moment, Single family residential is 90% of all the BWS's customer accounts. And together they use about 35% of the water that's produced here. Now importantly, they pay 95% of their cost of service. Not 100%, but 95%. So in aggregate, they're not paying the full amount that it takes for the board to provide that water to them. If you go down to the orange bar, that's non-residential customers. And in total, they're about 5% of the customer accounts. And they use about the same amount of water as single family residential, about 35, 34, 35%. And they pay 117% of their cost of service. So they're paying more than it costs to serve them. Now that difference is used to offset the discount for single family residential and also to support lower rates for agricultural customers and non-potable and recycled water customers. And that's supporting non-potable and recycled water customers is really a big benefit to everybody. The more non-potable and recycled water that can be used, that saves the potable water for drinking and other uh, more you know, higher value uses. Supporting agricultural customers with lower rates has been in place for decades and it's a, a, a strong community value here to encourage the local production of of fresh produce. So what's being proposed is a series of rate increases over a five and a half year period that would begin on January 1st, 2024, and then the next increase would be July 1st, 2024, and then each July 1st thereafter through 2028. And the increases would be 10% the first time, then 10%, then 9, then 8.5, and 8, and 8. And eight. And those increases are the same for each of the customer classes. So if we look at single family residential as a whole, that class will see that same set of increases that I just showed you, which will be the same for all the other customer classes. 
but I do want to note that there may be some differences by tier, and I'm going to show you what I mean as we walk through these examples. Single family, multi-unit residential, and agricultural rates are tiered. So what that means is, if we look at single family residential at the top, the first 2,000 gallons of water use is called the essential needs tier. And it, customers using that increment of water pay $4.46 per thousand gallons currently. Okay, that's a below cost rate. And every customer gets the benefit of that rate. No matter how much they're using, the first 2,000 gallons is at that lowest rate. The next tier is for usage from 2,000 to 6,000 gallons per month. That's at a slightly higher rate, $5.25 per thousand. The third tier goes from 6,000 to 30,000 gallons. Again, it's a little bit higher rate. And the highest tier is for usage over 30,000 gallons a month. About 3% of BWS's customer bills are in usage amounts over 30,000 a month. That's a lot of water. 30,000 gallons a month is three times as much water as the average BWS single family residential customer uses. About half the customers use more than 6,000 gallons a month and about half use less than 6,000. And about 10% of customers are in that lowest tier. Their bills don't go over that. Multi-unit residential tiers are very similar. The essential needs tier is exactly the same. The other tiers are set a little bit lower recognizing the fact that multi-unit residential doesn't have the same amount of outdoor irrigation. So we set the tiers a little bit lower to reflect that. So what's being proposed is to limit the increases in the essential needs tier to 2.5% per year. This is, as I said, a below cost rate. All residential customers get that rate for their 2, 000, first 2,000 gallons of usage. And about 10% of customers use that or less. So that's what you see. There's a lot going in, on in this chart. So let's just look at it for a second. The tiers that I just described are going along the bottom. You can see tier one through tier four. And then the cost per thousand gallons is what's on the, the vertical axis. The blue bar is the current rate in that tier. And the orange bar is what it would be on July 1st of 2028. So I mentioned the increases in tier one would be just two and a half percent per year. And you can see that the difference in height between the blue and the orange bars is really small. What's being proposed is that the rates would go up for the highest tiers of usage. And that's why you see the difference in height between the blue bars and uh, orange bars increasing as we move further to the right in that chart. And that's, again, the top 3% of single family users would pay the, the highest rate in these tiers. This is looking at the same information, but filling in the details for all the years. So the yellow uh, uh, cells are the tiers, right? So the first yellow row is the essential needs tier. Uh, below that is tier two, and then tier three and tier four. The purple is the current rates. And then the blue columns are what's being proposed in, the, in terms of increases in each of, these, uh, in each of these years. So again, essential needs tier, they currently pay $4.46 per thousand gallons. That would go up to $5.17 per thousand on July 1st of 2028. An increase of less than a dollar. It's hard though, looking at those rates to translate that into what does that mean for my water bill, right? And that's ultimately, I think, what we care about at the end of the day is how much am I gonna have to pay? So the water bill is comprised of two main things. It's the amount that you pay for the water you use, which is the quantity charge. And then there's also a monthly customer charge. So let's break it down. This is, the, as I said, the, again, the yellow tier, the yellow cells are the tiers here, right? So you can see tiers one, two, three, and four. The purple is the current water rate. And then this is an example for a customer using 8,510 gallons per month. The first thing we do is round that down to the nearest 1,000 gallons. So in this case, it would be 8,000 gallons or 8K gallons. So the first tier is 2K gals, right? So we put two in the first tier, multiply it times $4.46, and we come up with $8.92. The 
Then there's 4 kgals of usage in the second tier. We multiply that times $5.25 or $21 total. There's 2 kgals in the third tier. There's no usage in the fourth tier. And then there's the monthly customer charge, which in this instance is $12.09 for a total water bill of $53.71. This is what your actual water bill looks like when you get it in the mail. The front of it has two sides to it. There's a green side and a tannish side. And that green side is the Board of Water Supply bill. The tan side is your sewer bill from the Department of Environmental Services. Different agency, different way of setting rates, but it's billed, it's, it's on the same bill. So the $53.71 I pointed out shows up on the first page. And those calculations that we just went through are all right here. So you can see how the bill's calculated on your own bill, figure it out. Um, the, the usage in each tier is shown, the rates are all there, and, and that all adds up. Uh, there is more information about uh, how to read your bill on BWS's website, and I encourage you to go there if you have any other questions or ask us tonight. I mentioned the monthly customer charge. This shows uh, the monthly customer charge. It varies by meter size. So the smaller the meter, the smaller the charge. The good news for single family residential customers is almost all of them have 5 eighths or 3 quarter inch meters and they pay the lowest charge, currently $12.09 per month. That would go up in those percentages that I went through before, right? 10%, 10%, uh, 9, 8 and a half, 8 and 8. And you can see that by July 1st of 20. 28, it would be $20.18. Uh, those monthly charges increase by meter size, and that's a function of those meters costing more to maintain and repair. And so you can see the higher costs reflected there. So let's calculate a bill, look at some examples. So this is for a low water user, a bill with 2,000 gallons per month of usage. Again, about 10% of BWS's bills are at this amount or less. The current bill, total all in, adding the customer charge and the quantity charge together is $21 and a penny. On January 1st, it's proposed that that would go up to $22.44 or $1.43 a month. You can see the increases each successive July 1st and on July 1st, 2028, that bill amount would be $30.52. I want to point your attention to the bottom row. Remember I said that the every customer class was going to get the same rate increase, but it might vary by tier. So here's an example. Remember what the first year increase was, 10%, right? These low water users are seeing a lower increase than that. In this instance, only 6.8 and 6.9% in the first couple of years. So below that 10% number, that's because they're getting the benefit of us keeping the increases in the essential needs tier low. If we look at the median water usage, 6,000 gallons a month, um, this customer, a 6,000 gallon per month bill, currently pays $42 and a penny. That would go up to $45.54 on January 1st, 2024, increasing e incrementally each July 1st and ending up at $65.58. You can see the dollar changes in the monthly bill, $3.53 increase, and it stays somewhere between that and about $4.34 uh, in each successive increase. Again, if you look at the percentage increases, this is lower than the 10% overall for the customer class. That's because they're getting the benefit of that lower cost first 2,000 gallons of usage. The same holds true when we look at the average water bill. This is 9,000 gallons of, of usage per month, and about 60% of BWS's customers use 9,000 gallons a month or less. So the majority of customers are paying this or less. That bill is currently $59.56. It would go up to $65.12 on January 1st, 2024 increasing to about $97.80 on July 1st, 2028. And again here, you see the percentage increases are lower than the numbers for the overall customer class. That gets made up by the highest water users. 
This is an example bill for a customer using 35,000 gallons of water per month. That's way more than three times the average consumption. Uh, up again, about three, this is the top 3% of water users. They currently pay $228.66 a month for that water usage. That would go up on January 1st of this coming year to $256.94 and increasing each July 1st thereafter, ending at $413.49 in 2028. You can see the percentage increases here are higher than the overall customer class. Again, it's deliberate in shifting the, the, the burden to those highest water users with the intent of encouraging conservation. If we look at multi-unit residential water rates, uh, here, these are uh, shown here. Uh, you can see the tiers again in the yellow. Uh, the current rates are in the purple, and the increases in each year by tier are shown in the blue. Um, it's a little harder to think about a multi unit residential bill, so let's show some examples. This, uh, and the, the way we figure out the usage by tier is to take the total usage for the building because these buildings are served by a single water meter. Take the total usage per build for the building, divide it by the number of dwelling units, and then that's the usage per, that's the, that gives us the usage uh, in thousands of gallons per dwelling unit. So the first example, 272 dwelling units on a three inch water meter, uh, average usage is 7,000 gallons per dwelling unit. And that bill is $8,619 per month. It would go up to $9,462 on the first of this coming year, and then increasing each year there, each July 1st thereafter to about $14,500. And you can then see, uh, let's, let's jump to the bottom row. This is a similar sized building, right? 277 dwelling units. It's got a bigger water meter in it. It's an eight inch meter, and they're using a lot more water on average per dwelling unit. That bill is $19,805 per month, and it would go up to $22,600 on July 1st of this coming year, increasing to $37,413 on July 1st of 2028. So the usage, that average usage, makes a big impact on the bill, and that's intentional. The more, uh, it's to put an emphasis and encouragement to conserve water. Now, non-residential customers, we talked briefly about them, and I mentioned that they pay 117% of their cost of service. These are businesses, restaurants, hotels, government institutions, uh, all, all of those things fall into this category. They pay $5.27 per thousand gallons of usage, and that would increase at the same percentages that we've talked about for all the other customer classes. So they currently pay, as I said, $5.27 per thousand. That would go up 10% or to $5.80 on July 1st, 2024. And then by those percentages along the bottom, same as all the other customer classes, and peaking out on July 1st, 2028 at $8.80. Let's take a look at some example non-residential water bills. The top line, uh, think about this as a uh, typical fast food restaurant, say a McDonald's. An inch and a half water meter, they're using about 230,000 gallons of water a month and they're paying uh, $1,230 a month for that water, okay? That would go up to $1,352 on January 1st, 2024, an increase thereafter ending up at $2,052 per month on July 1st, 2028. Uh, let's pick a, let's go to the bottom, a large shopping center. This is a three inch water meter in this example and they're using nearly 5 million gallons per water of water per month. And for that, they're paying almost $26,000 a month. That would go up to over $28,000 on January 1st, 2024. And by July 1st, 2028, it would be $43,000, uh, just over that. Uh, large industrial user, uh, that's uh, in this example, an eight inch meter, 
and they're using 31 million gallons of water a month, and for that, they currently pay about $165,000 a month. That would go up to uh, over $275,000 on July 1st, 2028. As I mentioned, there are lower rates for agricultural customers and recycled water customers, and those current reduced rates will be continued although they'll go up at the same percentages as all these other customer classes. So looking at agricultural customers, they have a tiered water rate also. And the first two tiers are exactly like single family residential customers. That's because a lot of these farms have a single family residence on them. But the third tier is priced lower. Remember I said they pay 60% of their cost of service overall. That's accomplished by having a lower rate for the third tier. Uh, and so, I uh, don't think I want to say anything else about that. I'm going to back up. Non-potable and recycled water customers, they also pay uh, lower rates uh, than, than the other customer classes. This is to encourage the use of non-potable and recycled water, which preserves that potable supply for, for other higher value uses. Non-potable customers currently pay $2.90 per 1,000 gallons. That would go up the same amount as in each of the other customer classes, ending up at $4.84 per thousand in 2028. Uh, recycled water called R1, that's divided into two customer classes, golf and other irrigation. Golf pays a rate of 65 cents per thousand gallons. It's lower because there's a lot of other benefits to the uh, system that uh, golf courses provide, including stormwater retention and other things. It also cost recycled water customers uh, extra money and permitting fees and reporting to use that water. Uh, so these lower rates help encourage that usage despite those additional costs. And finally, RO water or reverse osmosis. This is water that has the minerals taken out of it. It's used for very specialized industrial purposes. It costs more money to take those minerals out so these customers pay more for that. Currently $6.36 per thousand gallons. That would rise to $10.62 per thousand in 2028. There are also some fee waivers, um, waiver of what's called the water system facilities charge. This is a one-time charge that a customer pays when they're connecting to the water system for the very first time. So say, uh, you know, a new, a new development needing service for the first time, that's when they pay this. So the board has been waiving the water system facilities charge and meter charge for affordable housing and for homeless housing since 2020, 2018. And in that time, this has totaled about 2.5, 2.4, 2.5 million dollars of fee waivers. Uh, they also waive the meter uh, connection, the meter charge for fire sprinkler retrofits. They are considering uh, fee waivers for new farmers, again, of the water system facilities charge and the meter charge. This would be for uh, targeted really towards small farmers, those with three quarter and one inch meters connecting to the system for the first time. Uh, the total value of this program is limited to a million dollars. It's tied to some money that the board got from the state a couple of years back to help support or offset the cost of developing new sources for for agriculture. Uh, they would require proof of a, it being a, a viable commercial agricultural oper operation and also require a water use plan to ensure that water is being used efficiently on the farm. Now I mentioned that, um, I mentioned the low, uh, relatively low monthly customer charge, right? And then it makes up a fairly small part of the bill. The bulk of the bill is made up by those usage charges, right? Based on the amount of water that a customer uses. And that's very intentional with the idea that you're able to control your bill by controlling the amount of water you use. And to, so, so to help encourage that, the board offers a number of rebates um, for water conservation devices like rain barrels and irrigation controllers, uh, high efficiency clothes washers, things like that. You can go to their website and there's a water conservation menu 
uh, at boardofwatersupply.com and check all of those things out. I encourage you to take advantage of those. The board's also considering new water conservation programs. One aspect of that is focused on top water user outreach. This would include hotels, businesses, condos, townhomes, and then also looking at a direct install program for Kapuna living on their own, uh, coming out and uh, providing free low flow shower heads, uh, uh, faucet aerators, also helping with water audits of the home and ensuring that these folks are taking advantage of all the rebates that they can qualify for. So a very important element of helping customers control their water bills. Uh, I mentioned uh, some other BWS charges like the water system facilities charge. There's no changes being proposed to that or to uh, the standby charge for emergency interconnections or the two at the bottom. These are things that most customers will never experience, never see on a bill. Um, one exception is the, fi the fire meter standby charge. Some of our non-residential customers and multi-unit residential customers pay this. It's for readiness to serve. It applies exclusively to these uh, private fire protection systems, including automatic fire sprinklers that are collected, connected to an alarm system or hydrants or wet standpipes. Two inch and smaller meters pay about $8 a month currently. That would go up at the same rates we've been talking about to $13.34 uh, in, in, in July 1st of 2028. Uh, and it increases by meter size, and you can see the examples for each of those meter sizes and the amounts per year here. Where we are in the process, uh, board has been conducting technical evaluations of its revenue needs, uh, looking at the types of th costs that can be deferred out into the future, uh, you know, less critical things to try and assist with affordability, uh, operations and maintenance, maintenance expenses, that belt tightening that I talked about, evaluating the different water rate options, looking at the customer impacts. That's been going on for about 18 months or so. And then that has resulted in an update, uh, uh, a draft update to, to these rates uh, that was reviewed with its board in June. And now it's in the process of seeking public input on these. That has started in July and is continuing through September, all leading up to the, their board considering all of that public input and giving formal consideration to uh, a, a rate proposal in September or October of this year. You're in the midst of an extensive public outreach process. This is the second of four community meetings. Uh, there are, are two more, uh, tomorrow night in Kapolei and next week in Mililani. Um, there, the board has also been going out and uh, to all the neighborhood boards that want and doing presentations and also to other groups uh, who are requesting presentations. You have the opportunity to provide input tonight. You can also contact the Board of Water Supply directly after this meeting. Uh, there's an email address here. You can call with questions. There's a QR code you can scan, a bunch of ways to, to get in touch and ask questions. And with that, I'll stop and uh, welcome your questions. Uh, anything about the presentation or proposed rates, all I do ask is that you, you come on up to the microphone so the whole room can. Please don't be shy. There's uh, ample opportunity for our questions uh, from anyone. Oh, oh can you come up to the mic? Thank you. Come on up. I was going to wait until last because mine are more <laughs> wacky than probably most of mine. <laughs> Those are the fun ones. Yeah. Uh, my name is Thomas Brand. I'm a 44 year resident. Uh, um, I met Mr. Lau a few years ago. But every time we discuss things, it's always a little bit beyond the curve, right? <laughs> Over the horizon. But um, I'm interested, in addition to the things you've already considered in terms of conservation to reduce usage and so forth, uh, some more uh, uh, out of the box ideas. I'd like to know if they're on your radar screen. I've been reading, <clears throat> well, there's a technology that already exists called fog traps, it can be used in very dry areas to capture water on a decentralized basis. Uh, 
I've heard of solar photovoltaic cells that can now generate electricity and capture fresh water from the ambient atmosphere. <clears throat> so these are new ideas that you might, if they're not on your drawing board, might want to put them there in the future if we look for new and other ways. Mr. Lau and I have discussed the possibility of desalination of seawater if Red Hill gets contaminated, the climate change dries everything up, and the possibility of also using that to separate seawater, hydrogen, from oxygen to produce hydrogen as an energy storage medium to make us more energy self-reliant. So there might be synergies that you could uh, capitalize on with the energy people, the renewable energy folks. And on the sewer side, I've heard about the possibility of using water moving through our water pipes, our sewer systems, our wastewater systems that can create many turbines, I guess, that might generate electricity, taking advantage of that. So I'm just asking, are you guys aware of this kind of thing? Do you think it has potential if we ever have to go that direction? And I'll stop for there. I could go on. But <laughs> that's uh, no, thank you, Tom. And I know that you always are looking beyond the curve. Uh, yeah. Into the future. <laughs> for so I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Barry Usagawa, uh, head of our Water Resource Division, to come up and uh, help me with the response. Barry? You can come up on the Hi, and thank you for the questions. So, so fog trip. Um, I know the, the Water Commission has been trying to evaluate the, the benefit, and it is a benefit um, in the clouds. You know, mostly it's the forest um, up in that elevation, um, St. Conservation District. It's important that, uh, because it does uh, allow uh, raindrops to uh, pull down the, the tree stump and into the ground, right? So it's not just rain, it, it could not be raining, but the, the fog drip does help. Rather about capturing, right, about capturing that, we haven't looked at that in terms of uh, supplementing water supply, but uh, thank for, thanks for the, the, uh, the idea. Um, in terms of seawater desalination, we are uh, just starting our Kalaloa uh, seawater desalination project out in Kapa Industrial Park. Uh, it's pulling salt water from deep wells. Uh, it's going to go through a similar process of reverse osmosis demineralization membrane process that you do with the recycled water, but this is going to be for drinking. It's for the Campbell Industrial Park, uh, 1.7 million gallons per day. It's a start, it's expandable to five. We got 20 acres um, at low cost from the federal government when the Naval Air Station closed, Harpers Point closed. Um, and so we, as part of the requirement for the land, we need to start a project. So they're in the, <clears throat> the design development phase. Should be online by the end of 2026, which happens to be my retirement date. <laughs> but yeah, we're moving towards that because I, you're right, it is, the, it is around climate change and, and uh, drought mitigation. Um, that west side is forecasted to be drier. And so the aquifers there may be uh, deep, uh, may be decreasing. And it wouldn't surprise me if the Water Commission did reduce the sustainable yields because the rainfall is decreasing. So it's a historical trend, but also a modeling forward look to 2100 that, that there, is a, there is a scenario where it's going to get dry on the deeper side. So desalination would be central, just like our expanding our recycled water system for irrigation and the uh, using as, uh, as much conservation efficiency measures that we can uh, put in. We have a good opportunity to work with new developers um, to install the most efficient water fixtures so that they, they use less water. So it has to be attacked on these, a lot of different angles. Uh, diversifying our system is one of them, but also watershed protection. Uh, we fund watershed partnerships that ensure that the forests are healthy, invasive species are removed, um, and it's around conservation. And that ties into behaviors and education as well. So we have a rebate program that allows you to, uh, if you want to conserve, we have rebates on a lot of uh, indoor residential as well as commercial. 
uh, establishments, looking at a turf replacement program as well. Uh, smart meters around your home to detect leaks. Uh, so there's a lot of technology in there that we can leverage on the conservation side. But it has to be that, that three strategy, uh, balanced strategy around resource protection, diversification, and conservation. So is that D cell project the first is the pilot project to begin with, right? Oh it's gonna be a, an operating facility. Oh it is, okay. It's not just a prototype to test the concept. Um, but it, it will give you an idea that it, it, the assumption is it'll cost will come down if you scale it up, right? It should. Um, we're oversizing some pieces of it, but we intend to also, there's enough room to have a photovoltaic farm next to it because oh. we're only going to take a couple of acres and then the rest could be a PV farm. So that would supplement the, uh, the high power costs because we have to pressurize the salt water pretty high to get it through the membranes. Uh, PV could offset that energy cost. Yeah, so you're, you're going to try to use at least some solar photovoltaic yeah, as a feature to piece. separate the, the seawater, right? So right, it's it's okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. And Mr. Lau told me that in the 90s he was already doing research on desalination, and he, people have asked me, what are you going to do with all that salt? He said he's already shown we can inject it underground safely and permanently, if I understood him correctly, right? Yeah. Um, what about the idea I mentioned about? Uh, the water moving through our, our, our pipes and sewer systems, is that feasible? Have you heard of that idea? Do you think it's uh, it's got potential or no? I didn't quite hear the... Oh, it was, uh, I, I don't know how else to describe it, except that I've heard of this, that people are thinking about designing or retrofitting existing water uh, systems, uh, fresh water, even our sewer systems, to try to capture, generate electricity from the water moving through the pipe. Yeah. Um, oh. He's an energy expert. Okay. <laughs> when he started this cell back in 1990, <laughs> <laughs> he turned it over to me. Okay. After, 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 after I left the water, water supply, I went to uh, Kauai. Uh, but uh, thank, thank you, Tom. Inline Hydro, we have looked at that. Yeah. Uh, part what is it called? Inline Hydro. Inline. Hydro power generation. So basically, turbines inside the pipe. Right. Uh, so as the water moves from higher elevation to lower elevation, you can actually generate electricity. Yeah. I think when we looked at that, it didn't seem to pencil out. Yeah, uh, the upfront cost would be huge. Uh, yeah, and then all, and also, uh, but maybe in today's energy prices, and this is something that maybe when energy prices were lower from more electric, this didn't pencil out, but maybe with the current trend toward higher energy costs, some of these uh, approaches might actually pencil out. So yeah, if energy costs go up, you're right. Yeah, more so that might be actually be uh, a savings or a generate savings for us. Yeah. So, but that's a good one. We shouldn't lose uh, track of that. Well, there's another one I, I didn't mention, but I might as well. If nobody else has questions. Uh, Bill Gates. Everybody knows who Bill Gates is. This sponsored uh, at least ten years ago, and I think he's done this several times. Uh, he calls it the reinventing the toilet challenge. And the, the, the original winners, they're pretty inventive. One, one design could, in your house, you wouldn't even need to be hooked up to the sewage system. And this goes beyond the state-of-the-art composting toilets, which already exist and are odor-free, supposedly. But his, the winning design, at least one of them, would convert waste into uh, electricity and potable water. You know, and that's just one of many, and you know, several designs won different levels of prizes and so forth. And I don't know how many times he's done that. This goes back at least a decade. So that's another not so new idea that if push came to shove, might be another way to reduce usage, right? But can be uh, we're so you know indoor plumbing like now everybody that's just normal and people can't imagine not having it, right? Whereas a couple centuries ago, nobody hardly anybody had it, so. But I'm just throwing out crazy ideas just to stimulate the thought and discussion. So, and, thank you. And Tom, I love our discussion. Yeah. <laughs> you got better than you did. It's just an idea before it's time. Yeah. I did want to point out, you asked a question about power generation in the sewer system. We are talking about the water system tonight, not the sewer system. <laughs> well, they're on the other side of your car. Yeah. Right? And 
They happen to occupy the same mill, but they yeah. are separate city agencies. And the, uh, the opportunity, that's, that system largely flows by gravity. So the opportunity, if it's feasible, is really more in the pressure pipes in the water system operating at higher pressure. So. Uh, any, yeah. Speaking of uh, hydro, we are working on a project uh, that Dave is familiar with, but it's a new one. Uh, it's a stormwater capture, but we, we own the four dams, uh, so it captures stormwater. Uh, the idea is to then pipe it down to one of our facilities and run it through a, a turbine to make hydroelectric energy, but also then a filtration uh, system that will then inject it into the ground to recharge our aquifers. So it's called the New Lono Hydro Managed Aquifer Recharge Recharge Project. We'll find a Hawaiian name eventually, but, <laughs> but that's what it's supposed to do. For, so from New Lono Four, and you know, climate change, right? In the future, we're going to see more intense droughts and more intense floods. When when it starts to flood, the dams are already capture that that storm water. So we're not taking the base flow of the stream. It's just the stormwater that's captured behind the dam, and then we'll route it through uh, and into that filter system, and then recharge the aquifer, and sort of helping the, the natural recharge process from rain. Because when it's storming, all of that most of, most of that just runs off into the ocean, so we'll capture it and filter. I'm thinking Lake Wilson, but are there four existing sites, or they, do these have to be developed that you're talking? About? Well, we just own four of the reservoirs. All okay. one, one, two, three, four. Okay. Four is the big one the dam that you used to fish out of and stuff. And that's the biggest one. So because we own it, the state doesn't want it <laughs> um, back. Um, you know, that would be a, a good way to uh, combine Yeah, because it lets you control runoff, so instead of just going straight into the ocean, yeah. you can get it to percolate into the ground. Right. right. And you've heard of the pumped hydro, that's a, a that's renewable right. energy, so yeah. this would combine the two of those things? This is a small hydro, it's not, it's not right. a pump hydro where they take a large amount of water and run it through a turbine and then use some PV to pump it back up right. and recircle it. Right. And you need a lot of water and a lot of uh, elevation, so that's uh, more costly. This one is is actually uh, less expensive. Yeah. Potentially, we're just in a feasibility study right. stage. Right. And a draft environmental assessment should be out uh, in the next so many months. But uh, anyway, it's something we're looking at. Kind of, uh, well, that's, yeah, because the runoff problem is it's just that. It, it, it rains too hard, right? It just runs into the ocean. It doesn't get back into the groundwater. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Uh, thank you. I just want to remind everybody we are here to talk about <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything, nobody else stood up. Any other questions about rates? Yeah, come on. All right, thank you very much, Dave and, and Ernie, uh, for the information. I'm Tom Heinrich, uh, speaking in my individual capacity. Uh, but especially I've been born and raised in this area of the Nolan Moyanini. Uh, there's a lot of things that we've talked about in the last few years, whether it's the Alawai uh, flood mitigation project or all kinds of other stuff. Uh, the focus for right now, uh, several things just real quick. I know that the first effort really is, uh, if adopted by the board, uh, kind of an immediate uh, half step forward uh, to try to get caught up because in 2024, there's both January 1st and July 1st increases, right? Uh, but we saw the slide where you're up 20% uh, on inflation and there's a lot of catch up to do in terms of that planning. Uh, so just knowing that. Uh, I had a question as to the schedule for board action. In fact, you have a slide on that. So if the board does propose or make adjustments to the proposal, then you're really trying to wrap that up by October, November uh, in, in terms of that action because you've got to implement it and start putting it on the bills. Right? Yeah. So uh, if everything works timely, then starting uh, the new rates January 1st. Right? 
Uh, one of the things, Ernie, I was talking to you about this before you started, uh, and just noting, because of the capital improvement project uh, program, the CIP program, is such an integral part of everything that goes on annually. Um, I just wanted to note that, if I understand this correctly, the cost of the next five-year plan, as that is reviewed, as that is implemented, and always subject to adjustment for all kinds of reasons, um, but the cost of that CIP program is included in this uh, rate uh, proposal. Yes. It's not something that, okay, we're going to talk operations on one hand, and we're going to talk CIP as a separate budget proposal. It's all in there for this rate proposal until 2028. Uh, that is correct, Tom. It, it covers our operating, projected operating expenses, but also our, our capital program needs. Uh, so the rates are going to generate enough revenue to uh, generate the, the money we need to implement both. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, one last policy question, uh, if you will, or, or clarification. The fee waivers that were spoken to, uh, obviously a lot of uh, work goes into, from the legislature and, and the council and everybody else, uh, in terms of the development of those public policies. Uh, but for clarification, is the cost of those fee waivers, or whatever those benefits may be, is the cost of that then spread out to all the ratepayers, since again, that's a different constituency compared to the property uh, tax owners. Again, this is the water ratepayers that- that's So the, uh, like the existing fee waiver program for affordable housing and homeless units and fire sprinkler retrofits for high rise buildings without fire sprinklers, that's about two and a half million dollars over the last five years or so. And that two and a half million dollars would have gone toward our CIP program so in lieu of that, we would have to uh, float, uh, sell revenue bonds, and the debt service would be something that we, all of our customers, including myself, would have to absorb. And the, that is a kind of a, a policy statement on the board to support affordable housing for our community, to help with the uh, addressing the homeless issue, trying to bring down the upfront costs of uh, these projects, please. Okay, appreciate that. Um, one uh, uh, slightly different question that I'll, I'll end with in this way, um, and partly because of uh, who I work with at the state capitol uh, is part of the Red Hill uh, review and everything else. Uh, if I, I would appreciate if you could clarify just a bit, just short, uh, in the sense of what geographic areas of Oahu are not served by the Board of Water Supply, because there are a couple of independent systems, right. and that is beginning to come under a different type of review for a lot of other reasons, but if you might just clarify, what's your area, what are those areas that are not included? Uh, it might be easier actually to cover areas that we don't serve, okay. because we actually serve most of the island. So we begin with the largest area that we don't serve, that's Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. Uh, that whole base has its own separate water system. So the event that occurred back in uh, November 2021, when, they, when the folks living on the base turned on their caps, their kit faucets, they had jet fuel contaminated water coming out of that. So that whole Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam system, which stretches like, from Pearl City all the way uh, toward town, uh, eastward, to maybe pool all road and goes all the way to Mackay, includes Hickam Air Force Base. That's served by the Navy's water system and not the Board of Water Supply. Uh, the next big area that's not served by the Board of Water Supply is the old Barbers Point Naval Air Station. Uh, that entire area is actually served by its own private water system that's operated by a private uh, water utility company. Uh, other areas like up in Schofield, Wheeler Air Force Base there, Wheeler Field, they have their own uh, military water system. And there are pockets of other DOD facilities like NC TAMs up in Waihala that have their own water sources too. Now also the Laie area where you know the Polynesian Cultural Center is located, that has its own uh, private water system there. Uh, that's not served by the Board of Water Supply. Uh, 
And, this, and there may be some pockets of small private systems, like in locally here, I think. Uh, they would like us to extend our water system toward uh, Dillingham Airfield, locally a ranch. But we're, we don't, that doesn't make sense for existing water customers to pay for that extension. That is uh, really stretching our water system out uh, that way. And it's, right now it's privately served. We're coming off military uh, army wells like for a right. Did I miss anything, Barry? Uh, any, or Kevin, any private water systems? No, I think I talked to one of them. Oh, why, oh yeah. OK, sorry. Top of your pigeon here. Uh, Waiahole Valley is on its own water system. <coughs> Uh, that uh, is uh, the responsibility of the uh, uh, Hawaii Housing and Finance Development Corporation, HHMTC. Uh, they're in the process of trying to upgrade that system to meet water water supply standards. Uh, once they achieve that, then you know, at that point in time, we uh, would consider maybe uh, taking over responsibility. So I think we've identified most of the uh, private water systems and well, there are a few more, like Kurnia Village, Kapa, uh, Kipapa area, some small private water systems. So that, that helps paint the picture quite well. So the rest of the island, the, most of the million people, is BWS Kuriyama. Thank you. Thanks. Anything else before we wrap up? Yeah, this has to do with rates. Uh, yeah. Tom, can you come, on, come, on, come on over. Thanks. Sorry, we're recording this. Okay. <laughs> Are these proposed five-year rates in line with past five-year rate increases, or is this higher than in the past for perhaps obvious reasons, or maybe not obvious ones? Uh, I think there's a number of obvious reasons. Uh, these rate increases for this five-year period, we like to do it in five-year increments. Uh, so people can see what the rates will be and start to maybe hopefully uh, adjust their budgets. Uh, the last five-year rate increases were lower than this set of five-year rate increases. And I think uh, we identified some of the drivers for that. Pandemic, Red Hill, um, the challenges we face uh, in our community. Yeah, and water's not likely to get cheaper. And then, you know, we learned out of Red Hill, yeah. and it's Ola and Kabai. Yeah. Water is like We'll have to pay whatever we have to pay. Well, we, we want to be very careful when we, we charge people because it's, it's a real kind of this balancing act of safe and dependable water system for our community now and into the future, and also a great affordability for our customers. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. Great questions tonight. I'll try to shut up. Thank you. All right. Well, if there's nothing more, I want to thank everybody for being here for this conversation tonight. I uh, encourage you to provide any additional feedback uh, through, through email, call with questions, email with questions, scan the QR code. It's all available to you. Attend another meeting. And again, appreciate everybody's input and attention. So thanks very much and have a great rest of the evening. Thank you, everybody.